Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to do, first do a slide presentation about the NCAA Eligibility Center. And after the, the slideshow, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. So hopefully you guys got some good questions for us. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So good we'll afternoon, everyone. Hayward St. Clair. And as uh, Kenneth said, we're going to start the presentation. On the NCAA Eligibility Center rules, please hold. We ask that you hold your questions till after the presentation, and we'll get right into it. All right, Kenneth. Let's go. Let's rock and roll. All right. So, NCAA Eligibility Center. Is it not rolling down like I thought? But okay, I got it. So, this is hey, real quick, Kenneth, can you turn on your camera, please? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the camera's not on. The video. Thank you very much. We're good now. Looking good. All right. Cool. All right. All right. So this uh, um. Talking about the NCAA, as Billy Center, we're going to give a little timeline. We're just going to keep on going because we're going to get to the meat, meat and potatoes of things where everybody really wants. <laughs> they, oh, they don't want us talking too much. They want okay, to see there's it. both of them. <laughs> so what is the NCAA? Um, so like I said, members of um, dedicated lifelong collegiate athletes. And basically, this is a protection for students as well as schools, um, kind of way of guidelining to make sure that students are eligible and um, not being... Um, Things are being protected. So let's keep it going. Fast facts. Over 1,200 college and universities, 98 voting conferences, 39 affiliated organizations, half a million student athletes, 1,900, uh, 19,000 teams, 90 championships, 24 sports, three divisions. Got something for everybody. A little something for everybody. All right. So, what is the NCAA Eligibility Center? The NCAA Eligibility Center, it, val it evaluates and certifies your prospective student athletes for collegiate competition at divisions one and two. What we're gonna do, we're gonna focus on the important information. Hayward, sorry, your, your, mute, your mute got mited. Uh, someone has entered this room real quick that I'm trying to get out. So go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Go okay. ahead, guys. I apologize. No oh, no problem at all. So what we're going to discuss, as you see from the uh, information, we're going to discuss academic preparedness, the student athletes participation in the sports. Most importantly, the high school courses that your student needs to take to become eligible for the next level. And of course, information regarding customer service and what you could do to get your student athlete prepared for collegiate play. All right, next. Timeline. Um, college student athletes should all, you know, suggestions, you know, go to the timeline so you guys understand things. So ninth graders, hopefully, I'm not sure what age levels we have on here. I know we have seniors, but hopefully we have younger students. You know, ninth grade, you start now. You start planning, take the right courses, best grades. Find out, you know, if you list, you can go and list of your, what your school's um, NCA course list is by going to eligibilitycenter.org slash course list. Sign up for a pre profile, eligibility center information. 10th grade, you know, just the same thing pretty much. Keep up, you know, if you fall behind, hopefully you won't. Um, you're putting time in the athletics, so please put time in the academics. Um, if you register a profile, you get certification, eligibility center, separate account. End of the year, you ask your counselor to upload your, um, your transcript to the NCAA Eligibility Center. So that's where schools are supposed to go and be able to see, you know, but start before they even look at you, start looking at to see what uh, your grades look like. 11th grade, well, here it's getting a little more meat and potatoes, but because it's two years or under. So now you're kind of seeing, um, kind of, you kind of know where you stand and hopefully, you know, who are athletically as, as well as academically. So we're talking about you taking the ACT or SAT. Um, this year, you know, they kind of waited for the class of um, the fall class coming in. However, they're not sure what's going to happen with you guys, so you should take the test. Um, they're not sure what it's going to look like next year for the fall of 21. Um, talk to your counselor, make sure all the requirements, you know, you should have started this kind of freshman year also, just to make sure. In 12th grade, well, this is a pretty much kind of a done deal to a degree. Um, go look at your fresh, make sure everything for graduation is still finalizing the last couple of things you need to do. You can request your certification. You know, say April for fall, October for the Williams Pitcher Rollies. After you graduate, have your, you know, your final transcript needs to be uploaded to the um, 
eligibility center. So one of the things that you guys notice, parents and student athletes, the same requirements or the protocol that you would do to start the admissions prospect, uh, pro, uh, process for the prospective schools for your students is the similar process for opening up and creating your profile through the eligibility center. As Kenneth mentioned, your ninth grade, if you have a student athlete, you want to be familiar with this in ninth grade. You want to actually start creating your profile so that the information will be ready to be uploaded in the system. One thing that, of course, we're going through with the COVID scenario right now, as the recruiter for one of our HBCUs, I've encountered and have experienced a lot of questions in regards to these test optional practices for the universities. As a recruiter and educator, what I definitely want to encourage and have encouraged through the various events that I've participated in, and Kenneth uh, can definitely shadow uh, my perspective, I want you guys to keep in mind that we still need you to prepare as if everything was post-COVID or if I can, if I can stretch it out, pre-COVID. Nothing has changed as far as the academics and enrollment for your students to get into higher ed education. If they've uh, practiced or if they are preparing to take their SAT and their ACT, I highly encourage, I highly encourage you still keep on point with that, making sure you touch base with College Board to find out where the testing centers are in your area or if they're going remote with it over the computer through the internet, I would highly recommend you stay on point and prepare for the standardized testing because your merit-based scholarships for a lot of the universities are still going to be based on the SAT, ACT. So I don't want you to stay in the mindset that you can do away with preparing for the SAT and ACT. I would highly encourage and recommend that you stay on point with that program. If your student is a sophomore, you need to be preparing them for the pre-SAT, pre-ACT, because as you can see here in the eligibility center requirements, they still need the SAT, ACT. All right, Kenneth, next slide, my friend. All right, the eligibility center registration. So you go to the eligibility center, you, you make yourself an account or a profile page, um, the eligibility center.org. And it gives you step by step. So it's fairly, um, and basically, they're making sure one thing you're not getting paid to play. That's kind of part of it. Um, but it's pretty easy steps with it. Just follow along. It's going to take you a minute. So be able to just sit down for, you know, set, set some time apart to just answer the questions and just kind of go through it. And it should, and you'll be fine. So you have two types of accounts you have a certification account and a profile page. So a profile page is really looking at more of the D3 schools. So really people, you know, if you guys are most probably interested in D1 and D2, because that's pretty much most of the questions. Um, yeah, there's a fee. However, uh, depending on who's at your school, um, for my school, I do it. Um, if you're eligible for an SAT or ACT waiver, you can actually get that um, domestic fee waived. So you want to pay that $90 um, fee. So that's a little bit more money in your pocket, or your parents' pocket to give you something else. Um, it's going to account information, school history, going to help the card for sign letter intense. This is main, you have to have this certification done. They're going to have all the information. This is where schools are, quote unquote, I'm putting my quotations up, um, is that they're supposed to go look in here to see if you're eligible to play before they even look at you, um, have a conversation. They have your grades are good, your test scores look how they look. And then this is also where they're going to, at the end of the day, after your senior year, they're going to go back into this account. You have to get, make sure you get certified. I'll say the profile page is the D, D3 kind of information. Uh, we're kind of going by it quickly, but here's the other side. We want you guys to go into this website on your own because there's so much information in there. Um, but we want to go quickly so you can ask them some questions. But there's plenty of information, so I highly encourage you uh, to go into the NCAA.org later on at your own time and play through all the different information. They have a wealth of information there. And you should be uh, knowledgeable. If you're knowledgeable in your sports, you're knowledgeable in the things that you need to get there. Um, basically, about review your dashboard. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of stuff to kind of tell you what you need to do. This is part of the process. You know, and as you progress on the stuff, they're going to give you little hints if you need to do something or add something to it. Like you miss your transcript, you miss your test scores. They're going to let you know the things that you need to do. Eligibility standards. All right, here we go. This is the important part of 
the presentation. It's going to get into the active, actual classes that you're going to need, the number of credit hours that are necessary to keep you eligible for collegiate sports. All right, this is a meat and potatoes of everything right here. What is a core course? In California, we call it what you say, and I'm not sure if you say Mike a little bit, but it's what's your A to G classes, but it's your core class, your math, your English math, your science, natural sciences. Um, additional courses would be like world languages and so forth, um, social science, additional courses, anything that your school is a college preparatory class, um, that are what the core classes are. So the NCA also has that list. You can do, see what your list, your school list is versus what the NCA and see where it fits in that requirement. So you'll know exactly where you stand and what classes that you have meet the, meet the criteria. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, the PE or athletic conditioning classes, those do not count your art class. You might be a great artist or a photographer, but they don't count for the NCA core course. Um, we'll say Paramount at this point, parents, that as your student is matriculating from ninth grade, making that transition into high school at 10th grade, that you guys go over the schedule of the classes that are required to take at each year of the classification. You want to make sure, as you can see, four years of English. So every year from freshman all the way to senior year, there needs to be an English class. Three maths are going to be required. Your natural uh, or physical sciences, that's your biologies, your natural science, your earth science, your geologies. Of course, you have your English comp, your English lit, one year of that. Your social sciences, which could be your poli sci, your government courses. And of course, as you can see, additional courses as far as your foreign language, you're still going to need a good foreign language background to meet your eligibility standards. So again, as your child is matriculating from freshman year all the way up, once you complete the profile, you want to ensure that the core classes are, the requirements are being met. Ready to roll? Yes, sir. All right. So there's a find your NCA approved course list, you go to eligibilitycenter.org and put slash course list. And every school has a, a school code, you can put that in and you can see what your class, your school, specific school has to, um, what qualifies for the NCA. Now some students I have, uh, that I had at my school also, have various uh, multiple schools. So if you have more than one school, you have to look for a list for each school. It doesn't just go for that one school, you have to go because they're looking based upon whatever high school that you attended. So if you have multiple high schools, you need to look at each list for the, that specific high school. Non-traditional, this is the this COVID situation has caused a lot of this. Um, courses taught through internet, distant learning, independent study, individualized correspondence, and very similar things. So here's the thing about non-traditional. Um, it's part of it. Taking an online or virtual non-traditional course does not necessarily mean you're homeschooled. And there's a home kit about, we're talking about homeschooling, about information there. I'm not going to really go into that. But things to consider before you take a non-traditional course. So as you see, the four is underlined. You got to make sure that meets the core NCA core requirements, the NCA approved course list. Of course, must have an ongoing and regular teacher initiated. And that's huge. So you guys understand it has to be regular teacher initiated interaction for the person teaching, evaluating, and providing assistance throughout the duration of the course. And it's, um, of course, it must be identified in time period of completion. So one thing you guys want to do, parents of your student athletes, if you're taking these non-traditional courses, you want to make sure when it, you mention the word non-traditional that the courses are certifiable and that they have met the credentialing uh, principles of whatever that governing body is. So you want to keep that in mind. So if you're taking courses, you want to make sure, in other words, that even with correspondence courses, anything considered non-traditional, that the courses are accredited and they meet under that one to four year requirement for academic uh, classes that your student needs to take. Go ahead, next. All right. Division one eligibility, initial eligibility and academic requirements. So as you see, um, today's vision sports, there's a time, there's a little thing with the SAT score. So it's also your GPA and your SAT score. So if you look at it, the higher your GPA, the less, like, the less your SAT or ACT score has to be. So you have high grades, you can get away for NCAA with a lower test score. Um, 
So let's just do the best we can. That's all I tell people. Don't shoot for the minimum, shoot for the highest you can do. And that, exactly. That exactly. Be, um, graduate on time, you need 16 approved court, court courses, correct subjects, you need a minimum of 2.3. Now, here's the thing about that. So people are gonna say, oh, cool, I, got it. I just need a 2.3. Well, if you look at certain colleges, they're not going to, they're gonna say, okay, that's fine. You meet the minimum, but they won't, they, you know, they, this is for the NCAA eligibility. It may be different for your college. Colleges, so, and I'm, my brother, uh, we can just expand a little bit more on that. But just because you have a 2.3 for the NCAA does not necessarily mean the school is going to say you're good. And you know, certain so SAT or ACT, some of you know, the scores must match. So you see this little timeline, this is again on the website. Again, yes. And, and just to echo what Kenneth said, when it comes to the SAT, ACT, and we're going to be mentioning this throughout the course of this seminar. I want you guys to get in your mindset, as Kenneth said, even though with the NCAA requirements, the student rigor as far as the SAT and ACT are kind of offset by a high GPA, you want to make sure that you keep your SAT and ACT scores comparable with your GPA. Because of course, depending on the university that you go to, the coaches might have their own academic standing for eligibility for your students to play. So even with the admissions process with student athletes, you want to make sure as a composite that they meet the minimum. So for example, with Prairie View, for your SAT, you have to have a minimum 800 to even be accepted into the university. And on the ACT scale, you have to have a minimum composite score of a 15. Now, this is when it gets kind of interesting because a lot of student athletes, if they've met their academic requirements and Kenneth can co-sign to this one, it also gets you the opportunity to receive academic scholarships. Coaches in today's age are looking more work to see if your student can qualify for an academic scholarship before they offer an athletic scholarship. So I want you parents to keep that in mind that as far as the weight of the academics goes, the academic scholarship is highly received from your coaches at the divisions of schools to see if your student warrants the athletic scholarship. They're going to look highly favorably upon your student being able to receive an academic scholarship. Absolutely. As Brother Hay was saying, and the other side, well, I, you know, as I said earlier, where I'm a high school counselor, and I like asking the kids, you know, if you're able to get an academic scholarship or athletic scholarship, which one do you take? And sometimes it's a trick question for them because they'll just say automatically, I'm taking an athletic scholarship. And I said, why? They said, well, so I can play the sport. I said, you can play it with the academic scholarship. And the nice thing about an academic scholarship is this. If you decide for whatever reasons, um, life takes over, you know, you've been playing sports for a long time, you say, I don't want to play anymore. The academic scholarship is not tied to your sport. Exactly. The athletic scholarship is. So just remember that. And I've had a student in the past who, you know, school warned him, but he's like, you know, I'm gonna take my academic scholarship because just in case, for whatever reason, I don't, you know, want to play the sport anymore. My academic scholarship is what got me there. So just remember that, um, student, you know, sometimes, you know, we get caught up in the athletic part, but if you can get academic, athletic, make sure you can try to get both. Because that way you're more marketable for yourself. So the schools, exactly. are gonna, schools are going to do, but you have to take care, you have to treat this at this point, start looking at it as a business. And you are the one owning this business. You want to see, make sure you're the product also. So you want to make sure that you're as marketable as possible so you can get what you want. Because the schools are going to get what they want. Uh, keep moving on. And this is, a, I love this um, slide right here because it kind of basically tells you the, the, what you really need. So seniors, some of this stuff is already a done deal for you. My freshmen, sophomores, our freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, you have to look at this. So tenant, you need 10 to court courses prior to your senior year. Prior to senior year starting, you need 10, court, 10 of these core courses done and seven that's to be, seven need to be in a specific area. That's what we call it 10-7. And if you're looking at it, um, those seven, you know, in your math, 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 excuse me, your math, English, and science, <laughs> starts in your ninth grade, in social science. Uh, to move on? Yep, go ahead. All right. So here we go. This is pops it down, makes it a lot easier for you to see. So again, we're going back to your core courses, which is part of the 10-7 rule. Going through your four years, you can see your true core courses, which are your math, your English, and your languages. You have to make sure that each year 
you're taking the required course for you. So whether it's English Lit, English comp a Composition, starting from your ninth grade year, you need to make sure you have an hour in each one of those classes. Of course, your math, and that math is something that you can't get around. Depending on what per degree that you're pursuing at the college that you're going to, you know, you might be able to reach the ceiling of algebra. I know with Prairie View for our engineering school, they highly recommend that as a high school student, they would appreciate you at least being exposed to calculus by taking a pre-cal course. So based off of the major or the degree that you're pursuing, you want to keep this in mind as you're matriculating through your high school years and the courses you're going to take. Of course, if you're going to be an English major, your English withstanding is there. If you're going into one of the liberal arts, which are your sciences and your math, you want to make sure that you keep up with your sciences. Go ahead, Ken. All right. And I see the little thing on the bottom that says four by four. If you follow that formula, you are good to go. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Just let you do that. All of this information, when you type in, you can do it the easy form of typing in the NCAA.org website or the Eligibility Center website, and it'll take you right to this information. All right. So another thing, we go, we're talking about the test scores again. So like I said, we want you to take them. And what the nice thing, what they do for the NCAA, and actually some schools do it too, is they kind of look, they look at your best score. If you take the test multiple times, and you see it by the slide, if you take if your verbals higher one and your math higher another, they will combine those scores together to get your appropriate score for its um, eligibility purposes. And one thing you want to keep in mind, you take the SAT or the ACT as many times it is available. I always recommend, and Kenneth being an advisor to students, he will tell you the same. We recommend as your student gets into high school, of course, ninth grade is the so is stepping into the pool, so to speak. But 10th grade, we really encourage parents to start exposing their students to the pre-SAT, pre-ACT format. Because just like any other thing that you work at, your brain is a muscle, your mind is a muscle. The more experience you have, the more acclimated you get to the testing rigor of the standardized testing. So when you take it at your senior year, you're familiar with it, you're comfortable with it, there is a significant decrease in anxiety when your student has taken the test throughout their high school years practicing with it. And when they take it at the time when it counts, they breeze right through it because there's some familiarity with it. So if you have the opportunity, definitely look upon college board so that you can find out when they're testing. And again, it's highly recommended, even with schools going test optional, you want to make sure that you're prepared. And when it comes to the certain options that are available with your standardized testing, I always tell my students, when you have the option to get extra credit or extra points, even though they say you might not have to do the writing, encourage your student to do the writing. Those extra points can do nothing but benefit the student as he progresses along, particularly in his collegiate environment. So if there's an optional uh, question on there, encourage your student to answer. If it's an optional uh, additional information needed with a summary or something that can help improve or augment the pointing system for your students, encourage your students to take that. All right, Nick. Oh, one, one other point. I know a lot of tests have been canceled because I have a graduate coming out. Uh, I have a senior this year also myself. And I know some of you guys scores have, you know, test scores, have, test dates have been canceled. When you're looking at the test that you might have to travel a little bit. So we have to schedule one and we have to go two hours out of the neighborhood because everything local is not available. So you might have to stretch out and get on the road a little bit to get these tests out the way because your local area may have, for various reasons, have council tests, but a different county may have, may, may allow you to take the test. So you might okay. want to get it also. Good information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. My next slide. All right. Certification. So you got three different things, four different things, early qualifier, qualifier, red shirt, and non-qualifier. Possible scenarios. Academic qualifier. And of course you can see, we cannot get around the academics. Of course, again, you see the core course curriculum for the uh, courses that you need, your Englishes, your maps, your science, your languages, Everything that you need to have as far as your academic qualifier early on is set on the website. That's early, 
So now let's go to a qualifier, which a lot more, a lot of people are going to be, to try to be. And we go to the 16 core, the 10 7, the 2.3, the SAT or ACT. And it tells you. Go ahead, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. And you talk about the practice, compete, receive scholarships, first year of enrollment. And as I was going to say, you want to definitely take advantage of whatever resources are available for your student athlete. If your student is weak in a subject, please, please, I encourage you as a recruiter and educator, encourage your student to take advantage of the resources of tutoring. Because, of course, you never want to go in uh, with a minimum score because that doesn't give you any wiggle room for whatever occurrences that may happen to happen, which will decrease it even more. So if you know that there's an area, whether it's one of the Englishes, one of the sciences or natural sciences or math, parents, please encourage your students to take advantage of the tutoring resources that are available. Red shirt. So you're able to practice, receive scholarship, but you cannot compete. And that goes, just look at the GPA, the 2.0 is under that 2.3. Still got the 16 cores and that science scale, but that GPA is a little bit low. So this kind of tells you, you know, that they still looking at, um, and must pass nine semester hours, eight quarters of the first academic term to continue practicing. So this is looks on, see what you start doing in college. So as you're registered, when you get to that college level, they still have some, now they have some requirements that you have to complete while you're there. I don't know if you want to harp on that a little bit more. Ken, have you found out that um, in your experience when it comes to students transitioning to that next level, how are they receiving information of redshirting when they get to their college of choice and they've been redshirting? What is some of the opinions you receive from parents and student athletes? Um, as you mean, like what they what the coaches are telling them or what they're Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of times, some of the coaches are just basically, you know, it depends on how, how heavy they're recruiting them. If they're saying that we're going to start right away, and like so be it. But then some kids are going to say, they're going to say, well, no, we're going to bring you on. We're going to redshirt you. And we're possibly going to give you a fifth year. And that's where, for me, it gets out of my wheelhouse. So I'm not right. sure how that applies um, as far as that redshirt year, because some people take that redshirt year to get money, but then they try to get money for it. And like I said, that's out of my wheelhouse. So I'm not really going to go too deep into that. Of um, course, of course. But uh, what kids, what they have said is that they, you know, most, most people don't, when they hear the red shirt, they're like, I don't want a red shirt. Well, it's not a bad I think, idea because I hear some kids have said it, well, it gets me a chance to get accustomed to the school. I'm able to be, you know, without having all things I have to do, I'm able to focus on my academics. You know, I have to practice. There's certain things I have to do, but I'm able to focus on my academics, which is going to keep me there and to be able to get, possibly get my scholarship. And that's the key point, the retention of your scholarship. So what it's giving you is an extra opportunity to improve the main reason why you're going to school, which is not to play sports, but it's for your academics. So that's one of the good benefits, well, one of the only, what I consider, the good benefits of redshirting. It gives you the opportunity to retain your student athlete status, and it gives you the opportunity to improve upon your academics without losing any of your collegiate benefits that you've earned at the high school level. And what's nice about it, you'll see some of these you know, players in certain sports that they, you know, they've registered their freshman year and now they, they worked hard enough where they actually, their last year or their fifth year, they're actually in grad school. Right. So they've completed, they've handled their business academically. So they got their BA and now they're working on their masters um, and getting that paid for it. So that's kind of nice. Half of yes. it getting paid for it. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Next one. All right. And this is what you do not want to see. <laughs> Division <laughs> I one non-qualifiers. Of course, with the non-qualifier, it just simply states you're not eligible to practice, compete, or receive athletics aid your first year. So it's imperative. And this is just a key thumb note that I always encourage parents to do. Whatever university you're looking at, if your students' academics meet the minimum requirements, you've made it well, but you always want to strengthen whatever coursework that your student is weak in. You want to take advantage of that summer prior because what they're oftentimes are going to do is offer the opportunity for your student athlete to come during that summer and take advantage of the summer programs, which will definitely help. 
I know we do it at Prairie View. I know the SWAC schools do it. I can't speak for all the schools, but I know most of the universities that I come in contact with, with colleagues, it's highly recommended that your student athlete gets a leg up and takes advantage of the benefit of improving his grades or her grades by attending summer school. And it also gives them an additional three to six additional credit hours to start off their school year right. And another thing while I'm thinking about it uh, for our lose my train of thought on it, is that I know a lot of times, you know, I'm not sure without saying who's on, this, on, on, the, on the call, and if you're being recruited already. If you're being recruited already by one school, you already might be recruited by multiple schools. Um, it really kind of also depends on, here go that, that academic piece again. The better your grades are, the, the, more, the more options that you have. And in my experience working at a high school, I had a couple of kids who put all their eggs in one basket, basically saying this one school, specific school told them, if you do this, this, and that, you're coming here. But what they did was they made themselves ineligible for other schools. So you want to be very careful of that, you know, um, parents, is that make sure that you have your, a broad base for your kids. Because I've seen that a couple of times in my high school career, more than I want to see that these kids are like, well, this school's, you know, choosing me. Yes, but you might have opportunity for other schools if you just be a little bit patient. Or, but you also want to give yourself the best opportunity to be successful for yourself. So be careful on that. Definitely. All right, next slide. I think that might be, oh, I think nope. that's it. Yeah, yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to get into our question and answers. The reason we're not going parents and students into the division two, because the information for your division two requirements, they mirror the division one requirements from every aspect, as far as the core classes you need to take and the number of uh, times that the student needs to take them those courses beginning from the ninth grade year. All right, so Kenneth, here we go. We're gonna go into some of the question and answers, my brothers. The first question, can you just do sports without signing up for the NCAA? Oh, well, if you're just doing intramural sports, um, yes. But if you're talking about playing um, at a collegiate level and playing the Division One, Division Two sports, you have to go through the clearing eligibility center. I'm getting something out of get cut to myself because I say clearing hours. That's an old term. <laughs> <I'm> older folks. <laughs> but if you're looking for the eligibility center, if you're looking at playing Division One, you must go through the eligibility center. If you're playing intramural sports at the school, you're good to go. Okay. All right. Here's the next question. Define walk on, please. Walk on. Oh, you want to hit that one or you want me to get it? You can go ahead and hit it. I'm going filtering through the questions a little bit. All right. Mm -hmm. So walk on, basically, nobody's offered you a scholarship. But you're saying, I can play this game, whatever game that may be. So you go on to that, to that thing. But first of all, hopefully you've contacted that school and say, look, you know, I know you didn't pick me, but I'm picking you and I can, I can play this game. So they'll give you have an opportunity to walk on. So you have to contact that school and let them know. So you can also know when is that, when was that timeline? When is that eligibility timeline that you can come on and try out? And then you go for it. And one of the things, this is a conversation Kenneth and I had offline. When it comes to your student walking on, one thing that you want to do as you also facilitate creating your profile through the clearinghouse, you want to create yourself a huddle profile, H-U-D-L. That is the centerpiece of student athlete athletics. You create a profile similar to that which is on social media. And what I always recommend to my student athletes is that you create the profile in mind that that's your student athletic resume. So you want to make sure you put positive information on there. You want to include action photos. If you have a friend that's a photographer that you hang out with, if you're practicing, you want to make sure that you include not just clips of the particular sports that you're playing in, but you want to let the coaches know and see what type of character and leadership qualities that you have. You know, you want to film them yourself walking to practice and talking about what your day is going to be like, what, uh, what activities you're going to do through your practice and how you're going to conduct them. You want to share your study time, you know, on a very minimum scale. Hey, my name is Kenneth Watkins. Of course, I just left football practice. I'm at home. I got some homework I need to do, the courses that I'm studying. You want to keep it social, but you want to let your coaches know, particularly during these COVID times, the character that he's looking for in his student athletes. 
All right, here's another one for us. Can, well, I, can I just add a little bit of that? Because I have a yeah, bottle, a little I'm sorry. Uh, that he's right there because he's in, in the, <laughs> he be my, my graduate this uh, 2021 is that um, Twitter account. I guess some, some of these young folks are using Twitter. I don't have a Twitter account, so I didn't know about that, but they're using Twitter also to get in touch with these coaches and put their information on there. So also, if you have a Twitter and some of those coaches that have that, you use a Twitter account. All right. Our next question. Do you need to take four years of foreign language to be eligible of the NCAA, even if some colleges accept two years of foreign language. Again, as we stated, you wanna make sure that you keep yourself in the know and you wanna go by, regardless of what the collegiate requirements are to get your eligibility, you wanna make sure that you adhere to the clearinghouse protocols when it comes to what they're asking. And again, you can go to the site and it will tell you if they tell you or recommend that you get four years of foreign language, hey, that's just a benefit for your student to be able to speak another language. So I would highly recommend, even if the university that your student is going to accept two years, what harm could it be to take four years in this uh, time where, you know, particularly in the United States, we have a multicultural nation here. So I would highly recommend sticking to the recommendations of the NCA Clearinghouse. If you can take four foreign languages, why not do so? Yeah, it makes yourself more marketable. I mean, just remember exactly. that at the end of the day. All right, here goes a good one for us, Ken. How do you calculate your GPA? Ooh, well, they also, so you can go to those websites. Um, there's a couple of things. And um, basically you can, uh, and easy way I'm gonna say is go to the website. They have a calculator on there that you can uh, calculate your GPA. But um, for us, I know, um, I think what we're talking about California, A's are four, B's are threes, C's are twos, and D's are ones, and F is zeros. So you can, you can, the big long version is you add all those different, uh, your classes and you put the numbers and so forth, but go to the calculator, go to the academic calculator to um, the best way to, because I've tried to explain it <laughs> verbally, but I know how to do it. But go to the NSA website, or actually there's a, um, when you apply to your colleges, they also have little um, calculators on there to compute your GPA. That's true. And you, you actually started to tell them the same way I was going to tell them as we were taught. A's, and check, check with your advisor, A's are equal to four, B's threes, C's two, D's one, and we're not looking for anything below that. So what you want to do, you want to take the total number of your courses, you want to add those numbers together, then divide them by that total number of course, and that's going to give you a pretty good overlay of what your GPA is. Now, when you're applying for the institutions of your choice, you want to take into consideration what grading scale that they're accepting your grades on. For Prairie View, we are we operate on a 4.0 scale, which is unweighed. I know over there on the west side where you guys are at, Ken, if you guys have a couple of uh, GPA scaling systems, but when yeah. it comes to your university, you definitely want to check because what's going to happen is if you're on a multiple grading scaling system, the grades are going to be converted nevertheless. So again, what I always recommend to students and parents, calculate your grades and keep them on a 4.0 or an unweighed scale. That way you're coming the closest to what your required GPA needs to be. Absolutely. All right, let's see, here we go. We got another one where you discuss how to get recruited. You can start this one off, my brother. How to get recruited. Well, hopefully, you know, they're looking at, well, first of all, keep your nose clean. Let me just start off there. <laughs> uh, because, you know, a lot of coaches, they're, they might go to games. And um, you know, I'm not sure what year this, this person who's asked the question is. But if you're a senior, they've already been looking at your team. So hopefully they've been, you know, like, so we go back to the, the huddle. And also, if you can send your information, if you haven't got anybody to contact you, you can send your information out. If you're a freshman sophomore, like, start putting your you know, highlights together so you can put it out there. But, um, and then start, and start you know, a lot of different ways here. So this is where it gets a little tricky because a lot of people play like AAU sports and so forth. And a lot of times people are getting um, looked at through these AAU sports because they go to these competitive um, camps or they go to competitive tournaments and so forth. So there's various ways you can get recruited. So if you're doing it that route, um, you know, you look, they're going to be seen there if you're going to these competitive places. If you're just doing a solo, you get, the whole, you get your highlights, you put on the huddle, you put on the Twitter, and you send it out there to these schools and say, hey, you may not see me, but, I, but again, I've seen you. Come check me out. Excellent, excellent. Again, your huddle profile is going to be the initial vehicle that coaches are looking at. That's H-U-D-L, H-U-D-L. You want to create your huddle profile similar that you would the other vehicles for social media. Again, you want to 
upload uh, your highlights, you want to upload uh, action photos, you want to upload any information that gives coaches a good picture of you, the type of person you are, how you look, so that they can get a, a, a gist of the type of student that they need, particularly as I keep as I kept mentioning, because these are the times that we're in until we get to post-COVID, you want to make sure that you're marketable. So think of resume or job package. That's what your huddle profile is. And as Ken have said, you want to make sure you're keeping those clean because if anything can be uncovered, it will be uncovered on social media. So students, be cognizant of who, you, who you're hanging out with, who you're playing around with, what you're doing in social media, because you know everybody is camera crazy. These high-end phones, they're recording some of everything. So just be cognizant of your environment, who you're hanging around with, and what you're doing at all times. Because at the university level, just like it's being shared, one of the things we do, we do check social media. So you want to keep that in mind. You are judged by your character and the type of people that you hang out with. There's been a many of students who meet the academic requirements. Their social media has been uncovered and they were with the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. And they have, you know, literally messed up their opportunity for getting into school. So parents, you want to make sure you encourage your student and motivate them to do the right things. Okay, the next question, do you know... One more thing like that, too. Oh, yeah, and go ahead. I'm talking about it. Your email, no, it's good. I, I was thinking about it. Email addresses. Make sure you have an appropriate email. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point. Excellent point. Look, I'm, I'm so glad you touched upon that. Parents, <laughs> students, please, 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 because I see it all day, every day. Create a professional profile. I mean, professional email that's connected with the profiles that you're going to create. You know, the, the cute little nickname emails that your students or yourself have, that's that's you look, that's not going to look too well on your first representation of your students. So make sure that your students use, you know, first, middle, initial, last name, maybe favorite number or a full name, underscore, last name, favorite number. But Coco Puffs and Sweet Boo Boo 97, that's not going to cut it. Make sure you keep a professional professional email and of course with all the email um, vehicles they have you can create numerous emails but when you get into the game of going to the next level of collegiate athletics or just career development you want to start utilizing a professional email address leave all the cute family nicknames and the nicknames from friends and whatever your personal stance is that you put in your nickname Mr. 5000, Mr. Millionaire we're not trying to see that. First, your first representation of yourself is what's going to carry you long way through. All right, the next question. Do you know what schools have programs for nursing such as neonatal nursing and athletic training? That is something that you have to look at on your own with your student um, when it comes to researching your universities. It's as simple as um, a Google search or when you look into the particular schools that you're interested in, you go to that website, and this is where your own research comes into play. You go into that school's website, and you check what colleges they have and which degree offerings that they have that they can present to you. At Prairie View, we do have a nursing program, actually one of the top nursing programs in the HBCU culture. We are considered top 10 when it comes to the nursing programs. In our region of the country, we actually produce the most minority nurses in the region. So that's something that you have to do your research on your own. You can either open search, Google it, schools that have your major or the schools that you and your students have in mind that you're interested in. I always encourage that you visit those schools even prior to you beginning the application process, just so you can see what those schools have to offer. Absolutely. All right, Kenneth, our next question. My coach didn't keep stats or take videos last year and we aren't playing this year. The student plays volleyball and they need rec uh, suggestions on how to get recruited. Again, this is where that huddle profile comes into play. Go ahead, Kenneth, I'll let you elaborate and I'll chime in on that one. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good one. So I'm assuming this will hope, uh, well, this possible person is a senior. So maybe there's some old stuff and maybe also if they have, if they play for like an AAU or one of those side teams or um, club teams, Get some information from there. If you're a club team or so forth, I know a lot of teams, a lot of students play club when they're doing volleyball and so forth. 
our, so use those information too and put that information in there. And then maybe, I'm not sure, also, there's no wrong with seeing coaches say, hey, my team is not playing this year. My coach didn't keep stats. Uh, can, I, can I send you something to show, and show, you what, show you my talent? So make your own stuff. Create your own thing by showing what your highlights and what your strong points are. And hopefully make sure to see what that – nothing about to look at with those schools. Sometimes I tell schools to see what's there already. So you might be trying to compete for a position. So see what's there already. So we may see if you can either um, – there are room for you at that school too. So you might want to look at that. But make sure you, you create your own huddle. Create your own stuff that you have. If you're on a club team, use that, inf use that information. But just awesome, make sure. Again, you'll hear Kenneth and I reiterate that that's what your huddle profile is for. That's where you will – Submit all of your information, your sports clips, your action photos, anything that's pertaining to your athleticism that has been exhibited, whether it's actual game play, whether it's like Kenneth said, AAU play in the even intramural or at the playground and your practice sessions. This is what's going to build that package up just in case, again, in these particular times when your uh, team is not playing at school, you're constantly uploading content to give the coach is something to look at. And what you want to do is switch positions. If you were a coach amidst these COVID times, what do you want to see from a potential student athlete? That's what you upload into your huddle profile. All right, next question. What are some of the factors to consider when making the decision to participate in organized sports in this period of COVID-19? Excellent question, excellent question. Um, safety. I mean, your own personal safety, your family safety. I think that's one of the main things that come into play. I mean, that's kind of a that's a hard, it's a tough question. It's a very good question, but it comes down, I guess, family and individual choice about really kind of what you want to do with that. Um, that's a hard. That's a tough question. Let me help a little bit with that. But that is a question. And as Kim mentioned, that's definitely a choice amongst you and your family for the discussion. At the university levels, we're implementing procedures and protocols to participate in the sports. Of course, if you all have been paying attention to the newswire, we will be playing football in the spring. So, of course, all the requirements are being met, health protocols as far as uh, how they're practicing, of course, maintenance of the field and the facilities. Uh, hygienically, they're going through what they need to go through. So. Efforts are being made to consider when it comes to playing organized sports, what you have to do again is check NCAA policies and those schools that your student is interested in or where there are prospective students going. And you wanna check and see that website on what they're doing athletically. All universities by state mandate has to keep COVID information on the site. If you visit Prairie View site, pvamu.edu, the first thing you see when the page loaded is COVID-19 frequently asked questions and information. So that's what I recommend you do when it comes to that. Go to athletics because they will have the similar information posted. All right, next question. Discuss the appropriate use and misuse of social media and the possible effects on the collegiate athlete reputation. Let me take this one, my brother. As I said this before, you wanna be cognizant of who you hang around with. Parents, you wanna encourage, even amidst these social times, uh, social challenging times, I should say, it's the same thing that we were told from our parents, your students, grandparents, you have to watch who you hang out with. You have to watch what you're recording and you have to be aware that people are and could be recording you. So if you have those friends, students that you know uh, are less incredible than in their character, you can't be hanging out with them. Because again, particularly now, social media is an aspect heavily weighed upon when it comes to you advancing in life, matriculating through school and everything else. I mean, look at what you see with the political arena. They're pulling up social media on these political candidates. So you can see how it can either move favorably in your position or it can harm you unfavorably in the same position. So when it comes to appropriate use and misuse of social media, of course you don't wanna be filming and taking pictures with questionable clothes on, questionable poses. And if we wanna get down to it, and I know I can get my brother to co-sign as parents of students and student athletes, you wanna refrain from your students taking pictures with suggestive clothes on, they need to know better. You want to recommend that they can stay away from the questionable poses. They should know better. And then you want to make sure that when they're taking it, 
your attitude can be seen, your energy can be seen on the picture. So if they're, you know, throwing up suggestive hand signs, you want to take away from that because you know better. So it's just the basis of using common sense, if I can use that term, because if it was common, everyone would have it. So let's say use your good sense when it comes to appropriate use and misuse of uh, social media. I like it. We got about eight minutes. We're going to try to. Okay, go. we got eight minutes. Okay, we got a couple more questions. Let's run through it. Can you work off campus while being a freshman in college? I'll take this one, my brother. Yes, you can. Yes, you can work off campus or as a freshman in college. This is when you becoming a young adult in training comes into play. It's on you now. The responsibility is totally on you. If you feel that you must work or you have to work, just remember. You're in college to help get you to that level in life where you're making good money to not only support yourself, but fulfill some of the needs and desires that you have as an adult in training. So if you need to work or you must work, just remember your academic responsibilities. And you want to work at a job where you have a manager that's compassionate towards that. All right, here we go. Can you pick your roommates for your dorm? I guess I'll take this one too, my brother. When it comes to the universities, yes, you can pick your roommates, particularly at Prairie View, we do have it on our housing section uh, in our uh, do not snore policy. That's what we cutely call it. If you and your best friend have both been accepted and you know you're both attempting to get into Prairie View, you can list your name, each other's names on your housing application. And that will take be taken into high consideration when you both are admitted. Of course, you do have to pay your deposits and necessary financial requirements and meet the necessary financial requirements to do so. So yes, particularly at Prairie View, you can pick your roommate. Okay, our AAU highlights, good to use. My brother, you can focus on this. We touched on it before, but go ahead and reiterate on it. The quick answer, quick answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, if you got, let's, talk, let's be clear. Make sure that when you put those AAU, make sure you're playing somebody that's competitive. Because you know, everybody, they can tell if you're playing somebody less than a average team and your team is great. Because you're not really, all you're showing is you can beat up on somebody who's little. So they want to see if you're competitive, competitive. I think it's great to use those um, AAU things. Exactly, exactly. Okay, next question. If my high school team uses Huddle, do I need to create another Huddle profile? If so, does it cost anything to download and create a profile? No, those profiles, uh, as of my last uh, checking, are free. And if your school has a Huddle profile, you do want to create your own and you want to transport those highlights that you're particularly in to your profile. That's a good question. That's a good question. All right, next question. Uh, tennis player in your neck of the woods, my brother, tennis player in California, but interested in an HBCU, how do you get in touch with the tennis programs that are viable? You can touch on that and then I'll touch on it briefly. And let me ask her this quick question to one of the few ones we have remaining. Is LSU, and I take it that's Louisiana State University and HBCU? No, LSU is not. LSU is what we consider in HBCU culture is a PWI, a predominantly white, institution that the historically black colleges in Louisiana and I can speak to that because I got my graduate not my graduate my undergraduate degree I am a Grambling man you have Grambling University Southern University Dillard University and Xavier University and of course Southern's branch in Shreveport has their football team as far as athletics and I believe they are division two so as far as HBCUs in Louisiana Grambling Southern Xavier and Dillard. All right, big brother, let's go right, ahead. To, oh, the tennis question. So mm -hmm. go to that school website, go to see if they have a tennis team. If they have a tennis team, get those highlights, shoot it over to the coach. But check out the school and make sure that they have it. Just go to the website of the schools that you want to go to, go to sports, athletics, and see if they have a tennis team. And there you have it. Again, it's the same across the board when it comes to your recruitment activity. First and foremost, Create your profile, as Kenneth and I mentioned, on the NCAA site. Go to eligibilitycenter.org, first and foremost. Second, make sure you create your huddle profile, H-U-D-L, H-U-D-L. You want to start creating content excuse me, and sharing your content to that profile. And if your high school has a huddle profile, you want to get the clips that you're in and transport them to or transfer them to your profile. Again, remember parents, student athletes, you wanna create your own resume package for athletics. The same thing that you would do to prepare for a job or the same package that you're putting together to come to me 
at Prairie View or any of my other 104 HBCU family members, you're gonna put the same package together, particularly if you're a student whose school is not being highly scouted, or if as a student yourself, you're not being highly scouted, but you know you have what it takes to do, I highly encourage that. I have your support, your brother Ken has your support, create your package in mind. Remember, keep in mind, if you were switching roles, what as a coach you would want to see in a package that a student submitted. All right, big brother, we got about uh, three to four minutes. No, Any that, one quick thing to that, make sure, you know, every, you know quick, and I, I see a lot of times with kids that I've dealt with, don't rely on the coach, rely on yourself, rely on your family, because the coaches might, you know, high school coaches, some of them are great, some of them are not. Um, so this is the reality is you have to take care of yourself and your family has to take care of you too. So make sure, yes, your school might have a lot of stuff, but as Brother Hay was saying, make sure you have your own. That is a must. That is a must. So remember, get everything in order. If there's anything that you need to take away from Kenneth and I talk, talk this day, SAT, ACT, keep it moving like you still were going to do it amidst the COVID situation. That's where your athletic scholarship eligibility is going to lie first. And remember, coaches are going to see if you're academically sound. So if you receive or have been offered an academic scholarship, that increases the likelihood of an athletic scholarship. Or because you're getting um, an academic scholarship due to your academic prowess, they can use that scholarship for another student who definitely needs it. So create your huddle profile, create your NCAA profile, Keep your nose clean, as your big brother said. And hey, let's get it. I'm, I'm glad to see that you've joined. I welcome you to Prayer View. If you need to get in contact with me, I'm on the website. You know my name, Hayward St. Clair. Reach out to me. I'm there. Any final words, big bro? Just holler at us. We're here to support you guys. So you see our information. There's way easy way to get to us. And check out the schools. And hey, got Prayer View on there. Talk to him. Talk to him. My son's going to be talking to him right after we get off this conversation. Uh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Reach out to the 105. I'm a staunch advocate. I'm a proud product. I'm a grambling man and a Prairie View man. So do what you have to do. You have our information. Reach out to us. TJ, it's on you, my friend.